Hello everyone, welcome. Thank you for joining us tonight for the virtual opening reception and curatorial walkthrough of the exhibition Speculations on the Infrared, curated by Christopher Green and hosted by EFA Project Space at the Elizabeth Foundation for the Arts. Um, my name is H.C. Huynh and I'm the operations coordinator here at EFA. My pronouns are she, her, and a brief visual description of myself. I am a late 20 something Asian woman with a black bob haircut with a fringe. I'm wearing gold rim glasses and I'm wearing a collared shirt with a psychedelic print with swirls of blue, orange, purple, and black. It's a pretty funky pattern. Um, so during the presentation, we're asking everyone to keep your mics muted. There will be a Q&A session held at the conclusion of the program. During the presentation, feel free to drop questions, comments, or to give some love in the chat. ESA is an inclusive and affirming environment. Project Space is anti-racist and anti-oppression in all forms. And no hate will be tolerated here in the event. Tonight's event will feature visual descriptions and closed captioning. Um, you can enable the closed caption captioning down in the menu on the bottom. And to make a land acknowledgement, um, this is Lenape Hoking, the Lenape homeland and gathering place for many indigenous nations and beings. When the unseated earth breaths again, there will be indigenous lives here, as there are now and have always been. It will still be Lenape Hogan. We learn from the bedrock and commit to uplifting, honoring, and listening to those who are seen and unseen, present and future. So now I'm gonna hand this off to my colleague, Dylan Gauthier, the program director of Project Space. Um, thank you so much, HC. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Dylan Gautier. I use he, him pronouns. I'm a 40-year-old uh, white settler male with curly hair, blue glasses, and um, black, uh, I'm sorry, curly hair, blue glasses, and a black button-up shirt. I am the director of the EFA Project Space Program, one of the three programs at the Elizabeth Foundation for the Arts, which is located in Midtown Manhattan. And uh, we're honored to be with you here tonight and are grateful for your presence. I'd like to take just a minute to thank the EFA staff and board, our executive director, Jane Stevenson, my amazing colleague, Judy Gira, our program manager who we'll be hearing from later on tonight. I also wanna thank Project Spaces Advisory Council and um, whose names are on your screen right now and all of our funders and also invite you all to support Project Space programs. Uh, in these unprecedented, unprecedented times, Small artist-run centers like EFA are all the more reliant on grants and individual supporters. Your contributions enable us to do this work, so thank you very much. Uh, I'm also particularly grateful to our advisory group for having worked with us to select our 2021 and 2022 season on the theme of Bright Futures. Speculations on the Infrared, curated by Chris Green, kicks off the season of exhibitions and projects, which will be curated by Angela Conant, Eli and Jeff Casper, G. Wesley, Radhika Subramaniam and Marina Zirkow, and Anais Duplan. Bright, Bright Futures uplifts art practices that are community-based, process-oriented, and future-looking, revealing contemporary work that engages with technology and society, politics and poetics, and fuses belief and praxis in the promise of a better world. So tonight, it is my pleasure and privilege to introduce our current exhibition, Speculations on the Infrared, curated by Christopher Green, featuring work by Damien Daniyashi, Nicholas Galanin, Kite and Devin Ronenberg, Alan Michelson, New Red Order, Unicorn Riot, and Lyle Wilson. We're incredibly grateful to Chris um, for all of his work and to all of the artists who have allowed us to show and share their work uh, with you here at uh, Project Space. In a few minutes, Chris will lead us on a virtual walkthrough of the exhibition before, um, sorry, I 
forgot my slides. <laughs> Here we are. Uh, speculations. Voila. Uh, Chris will be, mm, yeah, sorry about that. Um, Chris will be uh, leading us on a virtual walk through the exhibition before being joined in conversation by Tila Troge, who is the tribal attorney of the Shinnecock Nation and the lead organizer behind the Warriors of the Sunrise, a group, a group of indigenous women from the Shinnecock Nation who, along with allies, recently engaged in a month-long encampment, then some along Sunrise Highway in the Hamptons in eastern Long Island. Um, so I do want to just signal that uh, you should come in and visit the exhibition. Uh, it's on view until March 6th, and uh, we are open by appointment uh, Wednesday through Saturday from 12 p.m. to 6 p.m. Um, go to projectspace-efanyc.org uh, to sign up and uh, find a time to come in. We'd love to see you. Um, also want to just say um, before we begin, uh, with the formal program that we do have some events coming up just to signal and highlight the upcoming poetry reading uh, by uh, Demian Diniashi on February 16th, which is co-presented by Apex Art. Um, there's a, a series of virtual conversations with correspondents across the continent that begins on February 23rd with Anne Spice, who is the acting assistant professor of geography and environmental studies at Ryerson University in Toronto, to Cabranto. Uh, Treaty 13 territory will also be hosting a, a forthcoming workshop and public program with UPIC choreographer Emily Johnson, who is currently based in New York, um, Lenape Hoking, and releasing a catalog at the close of the exhibition on March 6th, which will be available online for purchase or download. Um, so check out our website for more information on that and for our upcoming events, which I hope you'll be able to join us for as well. Um, thank you all very much for being here, and thank you to all the artists. Um, in passing the mic to Chris, who will uh, introduce and talk more about the works in the show, I just wanted to um, put up this image um, so that you can see it clearly. Um, this is an image by the um, Heisla artist uh, Lyle Wilson. Uh, and just to give a visual description um, for those who would appreciate that right now, but I think for all of us to kind of meditate on what makes this such a fitting lead image for the exhibition and for the relationships that uh, Chris will be expounding on and um, that are revealed in the time that we're living in, um, just to describe the image as the figure of a bird with its wings outstretched, painted in a metallic shade. It floats on a black backdrop with a second set of wings in blood red hues overlaying the first one. There are yellow and red splatter marks along the bottom third of the image. So I will pass now over to Christopher Green. Thank you again, Chris, and um, we'll be back for Q&A in a little bit. Well, thank you so much, Dylan, for that introduction. And thank you, HC and Judy and the rest of the team at the Elizabeth Foundation for the Arts for inviting me to bring this exhibition to the project space. Um, it would not have been possible without an incredible team, even in the most normal of times. And of course, in these, the least normal of times, um, it was a, a privilege to be able to uh, share the work that um, some incredible artists have been able to bring together and have allowed us to facilitate. Um, thank you to all of them, to Alan, Nicholas, Kite and Devin, to the New Red Order and all their collaborators, including the core uh, collaborators, Adam, Zach and Jackson. Um, thank you to Lyle Wilson and the Unicorn Riot for their work from afar. And thank you very much to Alan and Jewel, Scott, Emma, and Alexander, and other uh, uh, drop-in and, and staff members at BFA who were tireless in bringing this series of work together. Um, I'm currently calling in from Shinnecock Ter Territory on Long Island, and I'm extremely happy to be able to, after my curatorial walkthrough, speak with Tila Troj of the Shinnecock Nation. Um, so that rather than a mere land acknowledgement of where I currently stand, we can actually introduce the audience to on the ground action in support of indigenous rights and sovereignty in New York state as they stand. Um, as you'll see the exhibition and the show and the work on display really takes this question of sovereign indigenous futures seriously. And these are futures that are pursuable at this moment and with actions we can all come together in. So I encourage you after my curatorial walkthrough to please stay with us while Tila presents on some of the essential actions that the Shinnecock Nation and the Warriors of the Sunrise are currently engaged in and that are key to pursuing a kind of indigenous sovereign future in the locality of New York State in particular. The exhibition Speculations on the Infrared is one that explores tactics of speculative indigenous futurism, those that foreground and redeploy 
what is a truly subsumed and repressive nature within the settler colonial state, namely the nature of the settler state to the colonized peoples and to take that nature and that subsumed relationship and see it as a potential tool for sovereignty. This exhibition considers the infra of infrared as not only that which is below, as in the spectrum below visible light, but also that which is further on, that which is beyond. Um, and the works in this exhibition speculate on how some of the latent desires for indigeneity and the subaltern indigenous DNA of the settler national mythos can be aestheticized to imagine new sovereign structures in our time. The exhibition asks, what kind of decolonial futures are imaginable when the elements of national narratives that are subsumed by the colonial process can be harnessed into the service of indigenous sovereignty? It asks how can robust futurist tactics exploit the realities of the appropriation and the consumption and the desire for indigenous culture that define so much of the settler colonial structure? Speculations on infrared explores how some tactics of speculative indigenous futurism can be less fantastical or science fictional than they can be confrontational. Confrontational of the subsumed and repressive natures of the colonial state, of its relationship to colonized peoples, and to foreground those natures as potential tools of sovereignty. This exhibition proposes that while indigenous futurism has many manifestations, those which are pursuing different indigenous futurities, those which in recognize indigenous people to already be living in a kind of post-apocalyptic landscape of despoiled treaty relations and rampant extraction, those are the ones best suited to envisioning new sovereign structures. And by working from that premise, the premise that indigeneity underpins the colonial nation state's identity formation and really its basis cultural desires, the works in speculations of the infrared suggest that there is a strategic decolonial position to be gained from that subaltern power. It's influenced by important leading scholars in indigenous studies, the work of people like Glenn Coulthard and Audra Simpson, who in their work point out the nefarious impact of the politics of recognition or what these authors point out is the granting of visibility and inclusion to oppressed peoples, indigenous or otherwise, as a strategy of maintaining the status quo without actually righting colonial wrongs or returning land or other consequential material actions. It's of particular importance to recognize the nefarious acts of the politics of recognition in this moment when among so many cultural institutions, we have seen a new rush to acquire and represent indigenous artists in particular in often the name of diversity and inclusion. Yet at those institutions, there is still a deep unwillingness to address the structures that resulted in the centuries long exclusion of those artists and the art of their peoples and cultures and heritage in the first place. The artists in this exhibition are all accordingly quite wary of visibility as a necessarily positive position. And they're wary of colonial consumption that mere recognition and inclusion can bring. As we'll see tonight, and as the exhibition shows, these artists instead opt for strategies of misdirection, of inundation, of refusal and obfuscation, and trouble that position of visibility in many different ways. The exhibition is really organized into three areas. Um, the first area, as we'll see in a quick swing through, uh, includes the work by Nicholas Galanin, the New Red Order, and um, the print that um, Dylan really beautifully uh, organized and, and described at the beginning. Um, this central pairing is one of the central to the exhibition. Um, before I go any further, um, I'll be giving um, as many visual descriptions as I can as we move through the exhibition, through the tour. Um, I should say that I am a white settler man um, in my early 30s who is wearing a faded navy blazer and a black t-shirt with long-ish brown hair and a typical um, pandemic isolation uh, beard. Um, the slide that I'm currently showing has a pairing of the uh, print by Lyle Wilson as described by Dylan and a TV screen on one white wall, which is displaying an image in infrared view. This image, this um, current screen playing um, what appears to be aerial surveillance footage of a series of vehicles and people lined up across a road uh, facing other more loosely organized bodies 
is footage from the Media Collective Unicorn Riot, which in late 2019 obtained over 100 hours of infrared surveillance footage taken by police reconnaissance aircraft during the 2016-2017 anti-Dakota Access Pipeline protests. The footage, which alternates between color and grayscale infrared, is redolent of US military drone strikes in the Middle East, but here we can see the outlines of teepees, tented dwellings, and other silhouettes that identify the sites as the Sacred Stone and Osetia Sakowin camps near the Standing Rock Reservation. The moving bodies are indigenous water protectors and their allies. And in the surveillance footage, the movements of water protectors were relayed by aircraft constantly flying over the site um, down to the militarized police and the militia forces that had been mustered to quell resistance to the pipeline, which as I'm sure many of us know, crosses treaty territory and the life-giving water sources for the, for the Dakota, Lakota, Nakota um, of Standing Rock and their nearby communities. In late 2019, this footage inspired the premise of this exhibition. Not just the surveillance of indigenous bodies by the militarized state, which is a, a very regular thing in the history of the United States, Canada, and other settler nations, but moments in this infrared feed when the surveillance footage is obscured and disrupted. Elements in times when cook fire smoke, when tear gas, when surprising natural encounters disrupt the, uh, the flow of the surveillance footage. There's amazing moments when the reconnaissance vehicle actually begins to follow a herd of bison away from some of the protesters. It's kind of captured by the movement of natural uh, animal beings. What's important for this exhibition are moments in this footage when the confrontations between the water protectors and law enforcement at the frontline barricades um, begin to escalate. And when many violent tactics such as flashbang grenades and sound cannons become visible. Um, this, for example, on the screen right now in the black and white footage are a series of barricades and um, the protectors facing police, police opposition. Some of these images are famous ones from the media coverage more mainstream of the protests, particularly those when the police began spraying freezing water on the indigenous defenders and their allies, which is lethal and below freezing temperatures. Yet in the infrared footage, this brutal police tactic actually begins to undermine the surveillance. The water begins to mask body temperatures from the thermographic technology of infrared capture, making the bodies of the water protectors actually invisible to surveillance. Their body temperatures drop, they're no longer visible in the camera. So in the footage, which is about a two hour loop in the gallery space, indigenous bodies actually disappear from view. The water cloaks them, cloaks the pr protesters from the colonial police state's machine vision. And this visualization, comes to be a central premise of the exhibition, that there is a power, there is a power in the resistance and a strategic position to be gained from a lack of visibility. The artists in this exhibition are likewise wary of that kind of recognition and visibility and in their included works offer many different aesthetic tactics for investigating and operating below that surface of the visible, below the visible spectrum, which is perhaps an advantageous point, um, not only for resisting consumption and co-option by the liberal settler colonial nation state, but also a robust direction from which to pursue sovereign indigenous futures. Here we're paused again on the untitled number one print by Lyle Wilson, which dates 1986, as Dylan described, a image of we get the Raven trickster from Haisla tradition, who is um, uh, executed in what is known as historic form line design on the Northwest coast. There is uh, red curved linear designs, which have been fragmented over top of a gray complete version of this design and blood red lithographic splatters beneath. In this print, which is early from the career of high school artist Lyle Wilson, um, Wilson visualizes this often violent relationship between indigenous and settler colonial political orders. The red and gray image of Wiget, um, who is the tra famed trickster Raven, um, is superimposed. But here, as we can see from the central white target symbol, Wiget has been targeted and the red form line has been shattered. The drips below are blood-like and suggest a connotation of violence. And Wilson here visualizes the tensions that were uh, emergent and ripe in the late and mid eighties. Um, tensions between settler and indigenous communities, particularly in the United States and Canada, which would in fact anticipate conflicts like the famous Oka crisis and the Gustafson Lake standoff, which came only a few years later. 
the blockade and land occupation tactics being used by indigenous activists during those early confrontations in the late 80s and early 90s are seen in much recent frontline activism today from Wet'suwet'en to um, the uh, blockades uh, in support of the, that, the Wet'suwet'en camp to the actions at the Dakota Access Pipeline protests. And there are kind of resurgent political action that renders asymmetrical relationships between the settler state and indigenous communities quite obsolete. Um, and likewise, the asymmetries in Wilson's print layer contemporary and historic aesthetic orders. They relegate Wiget's or Raven's wholeness to the background in part, yet as we can see, the gray nature of Wiget is waiting in the background, waiting to emerge with the light of the sun and the stars still held in his beak. Um, this is in this image reflecting the print over to the installation of the New Red Order, their pro generator um, reflection. And in that emergent visuality, there's not only a mixing of what you might consider indigenous and mainstream visualities, but Lyle Wilson's really showing that even in the breakup of indigenous culture through the oppressive histories of, of, of settler colonialism, there is a place in which it can emerge in a new light, just as Raven brought the light of the light in the sun to right. his Five people. One, three, six for 1400. Here's 12, two Pueblo items. There they are, and phones are coming in here. We can start this at 2000 only. I'm going to reduce the sound to here. the background, um, but just to the there. other side of the pairing of the standing rock footage and Lyle there. Wilson's print, installation by Clinton Nungak artist Nicholas Galanin. Um, it's titled Fair Warnings, A Sacred Place. And this is a work that I think operationalizes absence in an extremely powerful way. It is it's a photo and audio installation with the audio we're wish, currently yes hearing no. in the background, which asks the audience Here to imagine the future lives 3, of indigenous cultural out. heritage and communities that are often sold for profit in the cycle the internet, of cultural no consumption. The photographs you see cycling through depict empty display cases Thank from the five, Northwest one, Coast five, Hall five, five, at the American three, Museum of Natural thousand. History, which is currently undergoing reservation and Shield. were photographed while the belongings from the Northwest Coast Hall had been it's removed to storage in anticipation of that um, is that reconstruction. 3, you can see in the now. gray padding and matting of the display cases, the faint silhouettes, which are all that remains of the belongings that now. filled the gallery. 3,800 now. The audio Go recording forward. that we're hearing in the background consists of auctioneers from different auction houses who are collecting bids at, at sales of indigenous yes no, and other non-Western art and material time. culture. 4, they issue not yours. It's every now and again a fair warning, the, the last chance yes no. to bid before the hammer drops to close the sale and presumably if no more, fair, warning. fair warning, presumably to send the belongings to a new Five private collector. Um, Six, eight, and for the piece, for 4, the pairing 000, of these hollow displays, the empty 14, cases and auction transactions all. speaks the theft there of ancestral belongings from here. indigenous here. communities this by one. museums and private collectors and alike. Yet in this exhibition, the striking images of the empty museum hall also proposes another potential future, another futurity in which museum storage rooms are emptied and the collections are returned to indigenous communities. And Galanin is an artist who often plays with the role of cultural um, heritage and the ways in which the consumption of indigenous material culture can be played and operationalized and um, often turned in the service of what uh, Galanin pursues as you know, quite sovereign visual uh, creations. Um, and here he's really interested in how the communities, the source right. communities of these halls maintain what he calls the capacity to see Here's without being 15. seen and the desire to exist without being fed upon. A Hopi doll. And so in the, in the juxtaposition here. of auction, uh, auction lingo, and these empty display cases, we see a space in which uh, a different kind of future than that, which is necessarily being uh, heard and sold and, and, and hammered down is available. A thousand I'm the actor here. and Native American impersonator. I'm an accomplice to indigenous people. And for the purposes of this video, you can think of me as their proxy. Hello, Hello I'm Jim Fletcher, award winning actor. That is the audio from the central video of the New Red Order's installa central installation in the exhibition, um, which is a recruitment station. The video is titled Never Settle, and it's an ongoing digital video that operates as a kind of recruitment infomercial. 
The New Red Order is a public secret society of, of rotating membership, which has core contributors, Adam Khalil, Zach Khalil, and Jackson Paulus, and a number of collaborators who um, in this in this exhibition include Gail Prunkenete, uh, Inpatient Press, Emmett DiMuzio, um, Virgil B.G. Taylor, and others, and including Jim Fletcher, the, the central actor, um, who has been a recurring collaborator. Um, these collaborators are self-described informants, um, and alongside the informants, the New Red Order creates video and performance works that question and rechannel the desire for indigeneity to more productive means, and this is a central piece for the exhibition. New Red Order seeks to speculate on the desire of the settler for indigenous bodies, belongings, and culture. A desire that undergirds American society through so many years and manifestations of playing Indian and commodified stereotypes. And for the purposes of this video, they you can think of me speculate on this desire in order to create a kind of site of acknowledgement that can promote different kinds of solidarity and can shift obstructions to indigenous growth. They see guilt over this desire as being extremely unproductive and instead try to utilize that guilt and bring it and incorporate it and recruit it into a more future serving purpose. The installation they created and brought together for the exhibition that, is centered on this kind of recruitment station. You can see a lot of promotional banners, um, a drop cloth on a table in which you can imagine signing up for the society, um, rotating ads, and the central, um, uh, central video program, through which they really seek to enlist candidates in order to promote these different indigenous features and to, as they say, collect on colonial debts. I've learned to help. The ongoing video program Never Settle it is a, a kind of center to the know. recruitment it campaign so ad. It's a kind of viral ad, um, come infomercial, come self-help uh, 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 video, and that really explicates the NRO's different really tactics and principles. Um, for example, collecting and collaborating. Um, and through the video, it charts the path that recruits might take to become true no accomplices in reconfiguring colonial structures. Take control of your life today well has the program continued a lot it means to me it's all to grow move it slightly life. forward just to show Something and pause to on this window installation we see behind the recruitment station um, this is a new vinyl window installation um, a recurring motif that the new red order has taken advantage of in their different installations that not only throws a kind of red glow into the exhibition space especially when the sun is out it really glows red into and washes over the rest of the work um, but it also kind of acquires a red lens onto the outside and some of the visuals of the Manhattan streets taking on this red tint um, are, are really striking. It's a, a, a series of uh, images of uh, kind of rotating windmills, beavers, barrels, things that are the first reflecting the new red orders directive to its informants really and its recruits, which Remembering that we're they suggest commit crimes against reality, and and namely commit crimes against settler days. colonial reality. I've been able to, access to the left of, of myself, the installation, you can see existed. a wall that's been painted if in equal areas of way, white, yellow, red, and dark brown, and almost black, which is covered in images and different collective objects in TV screens, which are paraphernalia and, and a kind of background to the Mariana origin of the New Red Order. And I've never been happy. Um, this installation is called Pro Generator, and it features paraphernalia from the still extant afterward. improved Order of the Red Man. You can see, for example, this plate, um, this large certificate, all elements from the improved Order of the Red Man, which is an organization founded for white members to play Indian. Really I'll, I'll po point out just in the bottom corner is an image of the Boston Tea Party, kind of one of the founding ways in which America was based on white settlers part of taking on the role of the stereotypical indigenous body to be able to create a new nation state. Um, and this kind of paraphernalia fills this wall installation. Um, Progenerator is a portmanteau of progenitor and generator and provides a kind of background on the society's origins. Um, uh, this entire installation encouraging and bringing the viewer into a new future space that might be brought together by allies and informants. As we move through the gallery, um, you can see on in this fantastic installation shot, uh, a through line, firstly to Damien Diniashi's uh, vinyl wall installation. And then behind that is Alan Michelson's new um, multimedia projection installation, which I'll show at the end. So I just want to show some of these through lines, particularly connecting the Standing Rock footage to Alan's 
uh, installation, um, which I'll, I'll, I'll discuss in another moment. This new piece by uh, DNA artist Damien Dinayashi is, I think, one of the most exciting and one of the works that is perhaps the most essential to view in person. Um, this is a installation wall text of reflective vinyl that is titled Disrupt the Settler Colonial Simulation. And um, Damien's practice brings together text, image, and an extremely graphic visual practice, often in collaboration with RISE, or Radical Indigenous Survivance and Empowerment. Um, and, and and in their work communicate frequently through social media, an extremely survivant future, one that places queer indigenous resurgence in solidarity with cosmic and natural forces. And in this new text-based installation, um, it's based on a text that was uh, Damien posted on social media, but here is brought into the physical space as a, a, a short form poetic text. Um, and I'll, I'll leave it to the audience to read the words, but to describe it, um, it's a, a, a series of lines of text that are in a silver reflective and iridescent rainbow uh, material. And as this image slightly shows, there is a different way in which the light reflects the rainbows as you move around it. Um, and in that kind of rainbow reflection, the vitality of the piece reflects the vitality of the poetic text that Damien has composed. One where the ephemeral nature of the work really demands a personal experience, just as the artist encourages through the text for the viewer to reconnect with the technologies of survival that have persevered over time in sacred indigenous bodies and in other bodies. Um, and in this kind of rainbow, um, rainbow iridescence, new worlds emerge um, from the lettering of Damien's piece. Um, it urges the disruption of the colonial simulation um, through community care, love, and solidarity with nature, and um, encourages us to detach ourselves from what Damien describes as the settler fascist colonizer imaginary, uh, being wary of social media and wary of colonial manipulation, which is an illusion, an illusion of supremacy and an illusion of, of, of justice. Um, and the sense of illusion and the sense of the ways in which the spectrum of light is really being refracted here in the piece, I think beautifully um, illustrates the, the, the premise of the exhibition. I should note that um, there is a banner that Damien has designed, which is uh, to be installed outside of the gallery. Um, we don't have an image uh, in this um, short walkthrough, but words of resurgence really emerge from the banner on the streets of Lenape Hoking and encourage us to dream of decolonizing joy. Right next to Damien's work is this new piece by Kite and Devin Ronneberg um, titled Fever Dream. And if Damien's work is about disrupting the simulation of settler colonialism, this new piece by Kite and Devin is a kind of simulator. Um, as Kite likes to describe it, it's a conspiracy generator for settler futurities. Um, to describe the visuals, it is a television set, a uh, um, cathode CRT TV, set on a pedestal with different channels of um, news recordings, YouTube footage, and um, other talking heads uh, shifting with, with static um, while a white subtitle plays across the bottom. In the wall behind the TV is a morphing uh, visualization, um, kind of expanding out behind the television, drawing, drawing the viewer in. This is an interactive multimedia installation, and it uses LiDAR to detect the presence of the body in the gallery to change channels and um, represent and show different imagery depending on the viewer's proximity to the work. Um, Kite is a Magla Lakota performance artist and visual artist composer, and Devin Ronneberg is a multidisciplinary artist um, of Kanaka, Maoli, and Okinawan descent, um, who primarily works in sculpture, sound, and image making, and computational media. And they've brought their, stri uh, their strengths together in music and uh, the interest in the body and um, emergent technologies and artificial intelligence to create this work as a uh, response to the realities that so many settler colonial conspiracies are in fact based on 
the denial of indigenous agency, the denial of indigenous futurity. Um, we've all seen the ancient aliens shows perhaps on the History Channel, the idea that it's impossible for indigenous people to have been responsible for the building of the great indigenous monuments and earthworks of the Americas. Um, these kinds of conspiracies from UFOs to um, space cults to the military science um, complex, so many of these conspiracies are ways of settlers imagining new futures and these kinds of theories intermingle in this piece um, from a curated library of footage which is then paired with a curated library of text that's generated by a GPT-2 generated subtitle technology um, which draws the viewer and encourages its text to overcome formal biases by first breaking through the embedded conspiracies and mythologies and desires of the settler mythos. I love that image of the um, Heaven's Gate uh, leader um, as kind of a transition piece here. Um, and so between Damien's piece kind of working to break down um, colonial simulations and Devin and Kite's piece that sees the necessity in confronting them and uh, breaking into them, um, into the simulations and then simulating those conspiracies through them, um, we have the, the entryway to a new installation by Mohawk artist Alan Michelson um, titled Ehen Hanska Ktepi, um, or They Killed Long Hair. And this is an incredible new piece that Alan conceptualized for the exhibition. Um, if you're not familiar with Alan Michelson's practice, he is a Mohawk member of the Six Nations of the Grand River, known for his multimedia installations that deconstruct American settler colonial history, um, often through the activation and reinterpretation of archives from an indigenous perspective. Um, he's just coming off an incredible solo exhibition at the Whitney Museum. Um, and in this work, he's um, incredibly taking archival footage to really create a spatial and temporal connection through uh, an archival film projection onto this antique wool trade blanket. Um, to describe the image, we're seeing a large red rectangular um, wool blanket hanging vertically in a darkened space with two horizontal black strips um, that are framing a four quadrant image of men on horseback riding across the blanket. Um, the image that Alan has mined here is image of indigenous veterans of the Battle of Greasy Grass or 1870, of 1876, which is best known colloquially as Custer's Last Stand. Um, these veterans are riding at the site of the battle on the occasion of its 50th anniversary in 1926. They return to the site near the Little Bighorn River to um, really commemorate the, the battle in a, um, a cavalry march put on by the American state. Um, but here the Lakota and Dakota and Cheyenne and Arapaho victory is uh, really sequestered by Allen into a shortened victory mounted parade. Um, he's looped the remarkable film footage into a continuous procession of these riding warriors. Um, and this loop and the format is a reference to the winter count, the pictographic calendar that is used by many Plains tribes, um, uh, particularly in the 19th century and, and earlier to document the memorable events of the year. Um, and winter counts were often painted onto buffalo hides and later onto trade fabrics like muslin, um, in formats that often resembled spirals or horizontal rows. The work, Pehenhanska Ktepi, is titled after the Lakota name for 1876 in the winter count system. So here is in its title referencing that original year of the victory of the Battle of Greasy, Greasy Grass. And the blanket is replacing the hide as a substrate for the figures of these mountain veterans. In this loop, Alan is bringing time across different temporalities. We're moving from future to past. He's bringing the past forward. He's evoking the cyclical conception of time that the winter count spiral also evoked. Um, and in that kind of evocation, we see the enduring power of indigenous survivance and active presence and resistance manifesting across generations. Um, there's some incredible spatial connections happening here. Uh, the EFA product space is a formal, former textile factory in the garment district, um, a place where trade blankets would have left and gone to the, gone to the um, uh, western edges of the encroaching United States. Um, amazingly, Alan told me in conversation that uh, the win widow of Custer actually moved to New York after his death and from an apartment in the uh, Lower East Side near where Alan lives today, she began to issue and publish broadsides, essentially wartime propaganda for the American war 
with the Plains people. Um, and so I see this as a kind of projected textile broadside, a kind of message moving through time and space, projecting forward and backward, um, which makes an incredible connection to the ongoing and present actions and battles for indigenous sovereignty. Um, the, I, I will recall again the Standing Rock footage. I began the tour with um, the current efforts to, as we are seeing, um, renege the Dakota Access Pipeline, Biden's recent um, uh, closure of the Keystone Access Pipeline, ways in which these actions for sovereignty, these battles are ongoing for the Dakota and Lakota, Nakota and others. Um, and the resonance between the mounted warriors in Alan's presentation, the water protectors in the infrared footage, and the different fights across time and space for sovereignty point to ways in which some of these subtler approaches to visuality, some of these, these fragments, some of these hidden archival moments are places where we can see those sovereignties most visualized, most taking place. Um, and I, I thank the artists of the exhibition for their incredible contributions. I thank EFA for the support in bringing this exhibition together. Um, and I'm excited for uh, our, our conversation to continue with Tila Troj um, to show how some of these some of these um, conversations really continue across time and space. Um, if there is any questions about the exhibition, um, I welcome questions in the chat, which I'll be able to answer during um, uh, the DJ set, which will follow our conversation with Tila. But I want to make sure that we bring Tila on to be able to discuss some of what these current sovereign battles are in place. Um, so thank you all for sticking with me through the exhibition um, walkthrough. It's currently on view in New York if you're in the area. Thank you to my friends and family and colleagues who I see joining us from across the um, uh, across Turtle Island, across the continent and, and the globe. Um, and with that, I, I'd love to introduce Tila and um, the next portion of our program. So Tila, thank you for joining us. Um, just once again, really briefly, Tila Troj is a member of the Shinnecock Nation and a member of the Hassan Amisko Nipmuk Trad. She recently organized the Warriors of the Sunrise Sovereignty Camp in 2020 in an attempt to raise awareness about the ongoing conflicts for the sovereignty of the Shinnecock Nation. Um, Tila graduated from Michigan State University College of Law with a Juris Doctorate and a certification in Indigenous Law and Policy from the Indigenous Law Program. And Tila has been fighting for tribal sovereignty for the past five years as an attorney and as a, um, a tribal attorney for the Shinnecock Nation. Um, so thank you so much, Tila, for joining us. And I welcome you to inform the audience and inform our guests here to uh, as, as to some of the ongoing uh, escalations that the Shinnecock Nation is facing for its sovereignty on what is currently known as Long Island. Thank you so much for having me. And I'm just blown away um, by your collection of art tonight. Um, there's so much beauty and brilliance in the resistance. And um, I think that is certainly reflected tonight. And um, I want to talk a little bit about Sovereignty Camp as well as um, some threats of violence that were made against the Shinnecock Nation recently um, by the settler government. And so for those who aren't aware of the Shinnecock Nation, we are a small tribe on the east end of Long Island. And um, we have about 2000 members. Uh, we have around 800 acres of territory. And um, we got our federal recognition in 2010. And since then we've been steadily nation building and um, increasingly looking to engage in economic development as a means to provide for the general welfare of our tribal members. And so one of our first projects to really get off of the ground was a monument sign. And um, so they are called monument signs, but they are also digital um, billboard screens. And so we place them on the entrance of a road called Sunrise Highway, which was a highway that was built um, in the late 1950s and um, completed in the 1960s. And um, it's a highway that, that bisects directly through our, our tribal ancestral territory. And the state was the state of New York placed the road there without any type of consent or permission from the Shinnecock people, and um, uh, despite that, we um, 
you know, we, we didn't really challenge it. We've had this history of, of kind of being like good and loving neighbors to the town of Southampton, which has really been detrimental to us because we're not shown any type of like kindness, love or respect um, in any sense of the word by, by either government really. And so um, we put these monument signs up and immediately we experienced a large amount of resistance from both the local town government um, of Southampton, as well as the state of New York. And um, so Memorial Day weekend of 2019, we were able to build our first structure. Um, and so it's a monument structure. It has our tribal seal at the top and um, on either side in a V shape, it has 61 foot tall digital screens. And they were intended to be a pair of monuments. Um, nothing like this has really been done. A lot of billboards are vertical, but these are some of the first twin, um, I'm sorry, a lot of billboards are horizontal, but these are the first two twin vertical um, billboards. And because they're digital, um, they offer a lot of like opportunity to be super creative and um, they're really beautiful signs. And um, so we built them, it took us a, a couple of days. And by the time we finished the first one, New York State dragged us into court and very unfairly got a temporary restraining order against the, the project. And um, it was in the New York State court, but as a tribal nation, as a sovereign government, um, it's our sense that we, um, we have sovereignty. And so we're not bound by any type of ruling or judgment or anything by the state of New York or their courts or any colonial government. And um, that's something that these local settler governments have been successful in quashing for about 400 years. But now with the COVID-19 pandemic, we're experiencing um, a rather unique situation where um, there's this ma mass exodus of people from New York City um, trying to buy homes out in the area that we are. And we're in the Hamptons. So um, if you just think about that, where we're um, surrounded by billionaires, we're surrounded by 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 million dollar mansions. And uh, most of us live in extreme poverty. Um, there's a lot of housing conditions and that's um, the main reason that we started Sovereignty Camp is because our survival is at stake. It's literally a life or death situation that New York State um, and the local town is trying to completely cut off our economic development, um, which we desperately need to provide food for people, social services, um, and so on and so forth, anything that any other government would, would provide to people. And so recently, um, after about two years, we're, we're finally getting to the second monument and um, we got a letter from the state of New York, the Department of Transportation, um, saying that they were going to um, destroy both of our monument signs. And what I really think is um, incredible about this situation is right now in the United States, there's this movement to dismantle white supremacy. And a lot of that includes um, taking down and destroying monuments, um, you know, to slaveholders and uh, members of the Confederacy and um, all of those types of people. And it's, it's, it's an erasure what they're threatening to do. They're trying to destroy our monument, which is a monument to our, just only to our existence. And it goes in line with this continued um, history of just genocide and slavery and all of these horrible things that we have only survived because of the resistance that is passed down in each generation. Um, and so that's what's so beautiful about all of the, the art shown today. Like that resistance, it's not something that, um, it's, it's not something that it just comes naturally. It's something that is passed down to, um, to us. And so the art shown tonight reflects really just centuries of, of struggle. Um, but also continued existence. And so um, with our monument sign, even though we're facing, we're, we, things are really bad. We're facing this horrible outbreak right now of COVID-19. We've lost a number of elders. Um, we already in the best of circumstances didn't have many resources, but now we don't have any. And so 
In addition to the state saying that they are going to destroy our monument signs, they've also imposed a fine of $2,000 per day. $2,000 per day. We cannot, we're struggling to feed our people. We're struggling to keep our babies in diapers. Um, they're, they're also attacking our hunting rights, our fishing rights. Um, and it's, it's genocide. It's, it's genocide and it's happening today. And, um, and so we rely really on, um, on, our, on our allies to help us educate and to tell our story. And um, it's so inspiring to see also just all the resistance across the country. Um, like there's nothing special or unique about me. Like I organized sovereignty camp um, because I had to, because I saw that people were, that people were really suffering. And um, we've, we've gotten so much attention. Um, if you want to follow along with us, you can follow us on Instagram. Um, and I'm also gonna drop a link in the chat to a toolkit that we've developed. So if you wanna take action, um, it's really simple to do. If you use the toolkit, you can find some scripts to uh, make some phone calls to various officials in the New York State government and the New York State Department of Transportation, um, as well as some federal um, officials um, who were asking to provide some sort of oversight against the genocidal actions of New York State. Um, and we're also asking people just to kind of keep an eye open on what's going on. Um, and if there's any type of assistance needed, if they do come in and try to um, destroy our sign, uh, that's obviously gonna be met with resistance. And so um, things have really taken a sharp escalation um, since, since November. And um, it's just, it's, it's a horrible, it's an absolutely heartbreaking situation and a horrible reality to be facing um, that that still in 2021 this settler violence is it's still so strong it's still the lifeblood of this country and we need people we need everyone to do everything that they can to continue the resistance and I do want to leave time for questions so um, if there's any questions please feel free to ask me well, Tila, I just, I just have a question immediately, and I was um, really lucky to attend your teach-in on Wednesday, um, and you showed some incredible images and some of the evidence that the Shinnecock Nation has of, of course, um, not just the known lived occupation of your territory over time immemorial, but also of colonial documents and some of the earliest documented agreements between the Shinnecock and the original European colonizers. Um, and it seems like this battle is won over what kinds of uh, visuals or visibility are allowed. Um, the United States government, the New York State government don't want to acknowledge the realities of the maps that previous colonial uh, governments drew and that um, different trade agreements were organized around, um, but then they think that you're too visible in what the um, signs are doing and what the um, kind of like visual markers of, of occupation and presence are achieving. Um, so how, how, do you, how do you see and what can the Shinnecock Nation um, do about this kind of refusal to acknowledge certain kinds of evidence, but uh, 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 but um, demands for other kinds. Um, what, what are some of the, the tactics around this question of what visual materials the colonial government will even allow can you take? Exactly, and so um, I actually spent two years doing land research before we built this monument. And I just found a stack of documents, you know, um, a foot deep, all proving all, <laughs> all maps produced by the colonial governments um, indicating that our land is Indian land. Um, and so the reality that they try to shift, um, it, 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 it's really, it really bends reality. And the arguments that they make, they, they say things like, well, you're not actually Indians. And so therefore you can't have any Indian land. And it's like, we've gone through like 30 years of extensive um, study and documentation um, by the United States government that, that proves exactly otherwise. And so 
um, it's it to, to go to your point, um, putting up these monuments really kind of pushes us out of our comfort zone um, and it and it puts us back on the map. Um, and these monuments, they're, they're iconic and people know that they're entering the Hamptons as soon as they see those boards. And, and, and it, they make a very powerful statement that, that, that you're entering Shinnecock territory. And it's a reminder because we've just been totally erased. Um, you know, the, the narrative of the vanishing Indian that was covered in one of the exhibits. It's something that we faced for decades. The, the, newspaper, the local newspapers would say, last of the Shinnecock Indians has passed on. And so um, it's how they've been effective in stealing our land for, for so long. I mean, a lot of the land thefts people, people can't put into space. It's so hard for people. They think, oh, that was in the past. It was so long ago. But the land theft that we're protesting with Sovereignty Camp and the monuments, that was stolen by New York State in 1959. That's, that's, not, that's not very long ago. And um, our other major land theft was in 1859. And I think our oldest Shinnecock tribal member, he's, um, he's a bit over 100 years, but like he was alive during like all of this. And, and so it wasn't something that was um, so far in the past that we can't, um, that we can't even conceptualize it. Um, these are like recent things. Um, but the history, like, you see in the Hamptons, a lot of like reality TV shows are starting to focus on like selling homes in the Hamptons. And, and these people really believe that history starts in 1640 when they arrived. And there's like this rich culture that existed across this entire continent before the arrival of these European settlers. And so a, a lot of the work of the resistance is to reclaim our, reclaim our place in the narrative, put us back on the map, whether that be an actual map or a map of like time and, 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 and showing how we relate to each other. And um, just, we have to, you know, so, oh, so much damage has been done in the past 400 years of colonization, but there's still opportunity to restore balance. When you really look at the larger um, time span of things, it, 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 it really hasn't been, been that long. And there's still a possibility to, to work together to um, learn again, how to treat people with kindness and generosity and cooperation. It, it, we don't need to continue going into the future with this control, this um, domination the slavery, the genocide, it's still happening. It's not something that you just learn about that that happened in the past, it's still happening now. Um, and so um, another one of the, the beautiful things about the monuments is that we can use the monuments to spread this type of um, narrative shifting message of, of love. And that's what we're trying to do despite, um, again, these threats of violence uh, by the state. and. So we're so much more confident now with with technology that you know we can broadcast something and two million people will see it and that's one of the most powerful tools that we have right now um, in the resistance. Thank you, Tila. Um, I, I welcome anyone in the audience who has questions for Tila um, or questions about how to support. Uh, please post them in the chat um, while we have her here. Um, Mitila, maybe a question that um, you touched on, but is worth reiterating um, while any other questions come in. Um, what is the most impactful way that the audience can support the Shinnecock right now in this escalating conflict? Um, definitely just to keep an eye on it. Again, the toolkit has the best mechanism to um, reach the officials that we're trying to reach. Definitely follow us on Instagram. Again, the, the um, handle is Warriors of the Sunrise. Um, we will keep everyone updated. And um, so the letter that we received um, notifying us of the pending destruction of our signs was um, dated January 28th. And that gave us a deadline of 30 days um, for the destruction of the signs, which uh, comes to um, February 28th it, for the date that we really need people to be cognizant of and you know you could be available just to help us um, to prevent the state from coming in and you know actually destroying the signs that would be incredibly 
incredibly helpful. And, and if we do need people, um, we will put that call out on, on Instagram. Again, the handle is Warriors of the Sunrise. Great, thank you. I see that um, Luke Hornum in the chat just posted that toolkit again um, for anyone who wants to uh, follow that link to be able to find some of the ways to materially contribute and support the Shinnecock in their, in their um, conflict in there in, in supporting Shinnecock sovereignty. Um, and and Tila, are, are there any plans right now to get um, bodies on the front line? Does Shinnecock have any uh, need? Do the warriors have any need for kind of um, support physically in front of the signs? It, it sounds like the state is really pursuing economic warfare at this point. $2,000 a day fined um, is, is, is substantial. Um, and it feels like they're taking that route rather than attempting to demolish the signs or anything. Is that is that correct? That's correct. And we are, you know, really cognizant of COVID-19. So um, that's why we're not, we don't have an immediate call right now. But if, if the situation gets to the point um, that we will need that type of assistance, um, it is a possibility. So um, please just keep an eye on things uh, again on our Instagram. Great, thank you. Um, I don't. I don't see any other any other questions coming up in the chat. Um, but if you do have any questions, please follow the toolkit. Um, follow some of the resources that Tila's provided. Um, we're so thankful to have you here, Tila, tonight to uh, to share and to, to broadcast this this call of support. Um, and we hope that uh, as many people in our audience as possible will uh, follow those links and will will join in this. And and to above all bring more, uh, ironically, perhaps visibility and bring more attention, bring more eyeballs to this case. Um, because this is, uh, if anything, a, a, a place where public policy can be impacted by uh, a, a wide call. Um, I, I think I, I see Dylan has a few questions coming from YouTube. So I'm going to turn to Dylan for that. Um, thanks so much, Tila. Um, actually, HC is going to relay from uh, just signaled me that we do have some comments, um, conversation happening on YouTube. So HC is collecting those and can send those your way. I did, HC, I don't know if you have those right. Okay, great. I have one I can put in there as well, but go ahead. Um, do you want Do you want to jump in, HC, or should I? Uh, I can jump in, sure. Um, so there's Janine Cooper via YouTube, and she just made a comment saying, thanks again for providing a platform for Native people to share art, gain visibility, and acknowledgement that the devastation continues. My heart was broken when I learned the Shinnecock flight. Um, yeah, and this actually led to, I don't, I don't know if you have others to put in there, HC, but just a question that I had. Um, earlier was just thinking, uh, wondering if you could talk a little bit more about what allies you do have in the local community, if there are allies outside of the Shinnecock Nation in um, what is presently called Long Island that are supporting the struggle. And I'm just curious what the kind of community, you know, uh, not thinking of the billionaires, which you spoke of, but the, um, you know, that there are right people out there that might be supporting and just wondering what the, what the response has been of, of, of those folks. We believe that we have a huge um, amount of public support with the local community. One of the things that we did at the end of Sovereignty Camp um, was the day before um, what's known as the National Day of Mourning or uh, in the mainstream media. Um, Thanksgiving, we distributed over 500 bags of food to the local community. Most of it was um, was, was working people who were coming home from work. And um, we, you know, all we, there was a bit of controversy at the beginning of the project, but now two years later and in the middle of the pandemic, um, you know, 99% of the community seems to be in full support of not only the project, but the Shinnecock Nation. And um, some of the organized groups that we have been working with include the Red Nation, the Long Island um, Progressive Coalition, the Nassau County DSA, uh, the Suffolk County, DSA, the Sisters of St. Joseph, um, and I'm probably leaving some out, but, um, but, we, but we do have a large network of, of organized um, allies. And um, we also are supported by uh, Roger Waters from Pink Floyd. He's really helping us out with our litigation 
fees as well as some other thing um, he has dedicated himself to fully funding our litigation was which is extraordinarily helpful um, just so that we can ensure that any money that we do make can go to fund like our food pantry, our daycare, um, and our elder services. Um, and we're hoping to, um, we're hoping that once we complete the second monument that we'll have more funding um, available to directly support housing needs. One of the, um, one of the main points of sovereignty camp, you know, people were camping out for a month and it was reflective of some of the conditions that some Shinnecock people and even elders find themselves in. Uh, one of the warriors of the sunrise um, lived in a tent for two years and she's an elder and um, there, there shouldn't be nobody in the Hamptons, nobody in the Hamptons living in a tent and being homeless. Um, when we are surrounded by the most wealthiest people like in the world. Um, it's unacceptable and we're not going to let that be our future. And we're gonna fight back and we're gonna, um, you know, make sure that again, we can restore this balance where we take care of people and um, we stop the destruction and we stop the overdevelopment of, of this area. Well, thank you, Teal. That's so powerful to hear from you directly. Um, and thank you for your words and for sharing the, the ongoing on the ground uh, efforts and, and struggles that you are leading the, the fight against. Um, I, I can't imagine what New York State is doing as anything other than literally taking food out of people's mouths in this moment of immense need. Um, and the nefarity of, of, of doing that kind of extreme fine per day against um, against against the Shinnecock. Um, so just thank you so much for joining us this evening. Thank you for your words. Um, again, to everyone listening, please look for the links in the chat to be able to support the Shinnecock. Um, and if you have any questions for Tila, please continue to throw them into the chat throughout the rest of the program so we can um, send them uh, Tila's way. Um, and, and thank you again, Tila. Um, it's, a, it's a, a real privilege to have you. So thank you for joining us. Thank you. I think with that, um, I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Judy, the, the program manager at EFA, who will introduce the next part of our program. Thank you, Chris. And uh, thank you, Tila. Um, really, we will uh, just, you know, they're in the chat right now, but also uh, you can keep an eye on Project Space's Instagram. We'll post, uh, the toolkit and other links as well so that folks can have those resources uh, throughout the week and can support the Shinnecock as they continue to uh, take on the settler government. Um, and uh, I also want to take this moment, um, I'm Judy Guerra, I am the program manager here at EFA Project Space. Um, my pro uh, pronouns are she, her, hers, and a quick visual description, I am a uh, white early 30s transgender woman with uh, brown hair pulled back and daintily flowing down the back of my head. Um, I just want to take a minute to say uh, congratulations to Chris and to all of the artists uh, who uh, are part of this exhibition. Um, thank you for your work. Uh, as Chris said earlier, to put up a show during a, a normal time is already a very stressful and um, work-filled experience. And so to uh, do it during this uh, immense time of, of abnormality is uh, crazy. So we. Um, you know, thank you to the artists for their patience for the amount of Zoom calls and emails and, um, you know, strange emails from me at, at, at midnight with pictures of the gallery. So um, really appreciate your uh, your patience and, and I, I hope your work, you feel represented and that it shines because it really does. Um, so at this time, I would like to take us into our last part of the evening, which is a, a DJ set by uh, two of the artists who are in the uh, show, uh, Kite and Devin. Uh, so I want to just uh, allow them to just give a quick intro and um, also to say that during this uh, set, if you have questions again for Tila or for Chris um, or any of the artists uh, about, you know, within the exhibition, you can post those in the chat. Uh, we will continue to answer them. And um, if you are uh, in uh, New York City and you would like to see the exhibition, you can check out our website at uh, projectspace-efanyc.org. 
and we can um, you can make an appointment there. We are open Wednesday through Saturday, 12 to 6. It'd be great to see uh, some folks uh, who are able to come in and see uh, in, uh, in person. So with that, I'd like to invite Kite and Devin just to say a few words and then we will uh, get some, uh, some music going. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for all your hard work um, to get our project showing. Uh, we just wanted to say uh, that our DJ set, it's thematically structured um, for our, our, our work, uh, Fever Dream, um, and it's just a sampling of, of what we felt was sonically related. Um, for example, there's, a little, there's some drum and bass uh, from uh, Evil Intent, which is kind of my favorite political drum and bass album. Uh, yeah, we got a bunch of just experimental electronics and uh, inharmonic ambient stuff and uh, dystopian like electro, all sorts of things, but uh, just stuff that thematically fit our piece and hopefully the, the show as a whole. Uh, it, it goes lots of places, but thanks for staying. Give me one second, we're just having some technical difficulties here, my bad. <laughs>